Lots of modern manufacturing relies on CNC machinery. CNC means computer numerical control. That is, machines that shape a workpiece using a tool that can be driven to various locations. It can be a, a nozzle that delivers molten plastic, plastic as in three-dimensional printers, or a, a rot rotary cutting tool like these two router bits. At the moment, the tool in the image is partway through producing a model car. So, a typical 3D router has a cutter head with its own motor and three other motors. One moves the cutter up and down so that it can cut more or less deeply into the workpiece. We'll say that that is the movement in the Z dimension and that increasing the value of Z makes the tool approach the workpiece more closely. So, in other words, increasing Z corresponds to lowering the cutting tool. A second motor is responsible for, for movement in the X dimension, moving the cutter from side to side. And a third motor moves the gantry, that's the, the big inverted U shape, along the body of the machine in the Y dimension. Now, we're going to develop a little circuit that will control only one of those motors, the up and down Z motor, and we'll consider movement in only one direction, downwards movement in the opposite direction will be under the control of a similar circuit. So the Z motor will have two pretty much identical control circuits, one for up and one for down, and each of the other motors will be controlled by a similar pair of circuits. Note that these motors use a lot of power. The digital circuits that we develop in this course are not designed for delivering lots of power, so their output will go to amplifiers which will be used to provide the actual power input for the motors. OK, which of the three motors will we look at? As we said, we'll consider the Z-axis motor, and we'll only consider lowering that motor. Increasing the value of Z is equivalent to lowering the motor towards the workpiece. So. What control signals will the circuit be provided with? The computer that controls the router runs a program typically written in a language called G-code that specifies movements in each of the three dimensions and can also turn the cutter motor on and off. So amongst the signals that it will send in response to the G-code program will be signals to raise or lower the motor. Of those signals, our circuit is only concerned with the one for lowering the motor. But we also want to prevent the cutter from destroying the table. So the machine has a, a limit switch that detects when the cutter is too low. It will generate a signal called too low. But occasionally, it's important to be able to drive the cutter lower than the safety switch will allow. That usually requires human invention, intervention. So the human operator has a button that she or he can press to override the effect of the safety switch. We'll call that the down button. So, under what circumstances will the control circuit produce an output that will make the cutter approach the workpiece? We need a Boolean expression. Well, let's consider the normal operating mode first. That would be when the control program wants to lower the cutter and the cutter's not already too low, and the operator is not pressing the down button. And perhaps the other standard situation is when the operator wants to let the program override the limit switch. So if the circuit is receiving a lower signal, and the too low limit switch is raising the alarm, but the operator is professing, pressing the defeat button, then the cutter should be allowed to approach the workpiece. It might be worthwhile installing a sacrificial sheet of plywood on the work table just in case, and that is often done. But there are three in inputs, three Boolean inputs, which means eight input combinations. We've only allowed for two of them. So what should happen in the other six cases? Are there any other situations in which the cutter should be allowed to approach the workpiece? You might have noticed some. For example, what if the control program is not issuing a lower instruction, but the output of the limit switch is true and the operator is pressing the down button? She or he obviously wants to lower the cutter some more. But <laughs> it's all getting too hard. We need to be more systematic about it. Let's draw up a truth table. We'll draw it up in Kana map format in the hope that some minimization may be possible. 
we'll use L to represent the lower input. Uh, remember, that's the input from the computer program that's uh, controlling this device, and it's not the circuit that this, uh, the signal that this circuit will generate. We're calling that approach. T will be used to represent the too low input, and D to represent the down input. So now we can work through the table cells one by one, and when we've finished, we'll know that we've considered all possible input combinations. The first cell tells us what the circuit should output if the computer doesn't want to lower the cutter head, if the cutter is not too low, and the operator does not want to override the limit switch. Clearly, we don't want the cutter to approach the workpiece. And if the program does not want to lower the cutter, the cutter is not too low, and the operator presses the down button, well, I guess the operator knows best, so let's make the cutter approach the workpiece. Now, the situation when the cutter is not being lowered, it is too low, and the operator does not want to defeat the limit switch. Clearly, we do not want it to approach the workpiece. But if the program doesn't want to lower it, and it is too low, and the operator wants it to move further downwards, then that should be allowed to happen. In fact, when you think about it, whenever the operator wants to move the cutter downwards, the system should make that happen. So let's abandon our systematic approach and fill in the other two cells in the bottom row of the Karnow map. Right. Now, the program wants to lower the cutter, but the cutter is too low, and the operator has not pressed the down button. The cutter should not be allowed to approach the workpiece. Finally, we reach the situation that I guess you could call the standard situation. The program wants to lower the cutter, it's not too low, and the operator has not pressed the override button. So, we allow it to approach the workpiece. Right, well now we put rings around a couple of entries in the K-map, and we can write down the minimised Boolean expression. Here it is. The cutter will be instructed to approach the workpiece if the operator says down, or the control program says lower, and the cutter's not too low. Well, that seems a bit trivial really, doesn't it? Isn't it, isn't it just what you'd expect? Well, yes it is. But when we were faced with all eight input possibilities, it was difficult to be sure that there wasn't one that behaved oddly. The analysis certainly produces a result that we can easily understand, but it might not have been so straightforward to produce without going through the analysis step by step. Now, later in the course, we're going to look at designing a digital logic circuit based on a Boolean expression such as this. The remainder of this slide, in fact, deals with doing just that. And just for now, it won't make a lot of sense unless you already know something about digital logic. So, if you haven't covered the design of digital logic circuits yet, jump ahead to the start of the next slide, which deals with another situation that requires a minimised Boolean expression. OK then, let's start on the circuit. Three inputs. Lower, which is the input from the computer. Too low, which is the input from the limit switch, and which I've called T earlier on. And down, which is the input from the operator and we're generating an output called approach, which will be true if down is false, or when lower is true and too low is false. That's all the circuit involves. Just for interest's sake, here's an image of a remote control for a, a CNC machine. You can see that in addition to the X, Y and Z controls, at the bottom of the assembly, which are used for overriding limit switches and so on, there are several other aspects of the system that the operator can control manually. But we aren't designing CNC machines in this course, so we won't describe them. Now then, let's imagine that we're part of a team designing a nuclear power reactor. Nasty, dangerous things, nuclear reactors, and I wouldn't want to get anywhere near one or downwind of one, especially if it's got indigestion. But for the purposes of our example, the danger that nuclear power plants pose is quite a useful concept. 
Let's say that our particular responsibility includes designing safety features for the secondary fluid. One type of nuclear reactor uses nuclear fuel to heat a primary fluid, which gets highly, highly radioactive, so you want it to come into contact with as little as possible of the rest of the power plant, or servicing the plant will be dangerous, slow and expensive. So that fluid is passed through a heat exchanger, where it transfers its heat, but not its radioactivity to a secondary fluid, and that non-radioactive fluid, it's actually superheated steam in the reactor that I'm showing in the diagram, is used to drive the power turbines. So the secondary fluid is pretty nasty stuff in its own right. It's not radioactive, or it shouldn't be, but it's very hot and it's under high pressure. If it gets too hot, something's gone wrong. If the pressure gets too high, something's gone wrong. If it gets radioactive, something's definitely gone wrong. In order to maximise reliability, it's good engineering practice to install a separate sensor to check for each of these conditions. The detectors produce Boolean signals. It's either too hot or it's not, the pressure is too high or it isn't, the radioactivity level is too high or it isn't. So we could flash a danger signal if any of the three sensors let's call them A, B and C, if any of the sensors produces a true output. Well, that produces a trivial Boolean expression. We didn't really need to think very hard about that one. But sensors are not 100% reliable, and the more of them there are, the greater the probability that there will be a danger signal when there isn't really a danger. Maybe this arrangement is just too sensitive and it would shut down the power plant unnecessarily, which is costly and contrary to the intended behaviour of nuclear power plants. They're supposed to provide a, a constant supply of power, the so-called base load, with other types of power plants that can be turned on and off more rapidly, handling peak demand, diesel or coal-fired stations, for example. So it's standard practice for such warning systems to incorporate a voting system so that a warning is issued only if a majority of the sensors detect a problem. Well again, it's not that difficult to produce a Boolean signal, a Boolean expression for the danger signal. There is danger if two out of three sensors think there's something wrong, so that's A and B, or A and C, or B and C. So is that all there is to this? Well, yes and no. Because that's enough on its own to produce a danger signal, but if one of the sensors disagrees with the other two, then maybe something's wrong with that sensor. Or maybe something's wrong with the other two sensors. We don't want to shut the plant down when there's only one sensor broken, but we do want to check that the sensors are functioning correctly. So in addition to flashing a big warning light if the majority of sensors say there's a problem, we want to flash a small warning light if some of the sensors say there's a problem but others don't. Note that this includes the situation where two sensors are signalling that there's a problem and one is not. That's enough to make us shut the plant down, but we do still need to check the sensors. So we're going to produce a signal called disagree when one detector says or two detectors say that there's a problem. We draw up a truth, truth map, a truth table in Karnar map format. There's no disagreement if all of the signals, sensors are signalling no problem, and there's no disagreement if all of the sensors signal that there is a problem. But in every other case, there is a disagreement. So we fill in the rest of the table with ones. Now we can put rings around the sets of ones that conform to our rule. Rectangular arrangements and a power of two ones in the group. Unfortunately, the ones are arranged in a somewhat uncooperative way. We can only reduce the six ones down to four rings. Oh, well, never mind. Let's press on with the circuit. Again, as on the previous slide, if you haven't covered the circuit design section of the course, you can jump ahead to the next slide now and come back to this when you know something about logic circuit design. So, now we write down the corresponding Boolean expression and get on with the digital logic circuit. We have three inputs, A, B and C, and four AND gates, one for each term in the expression. Not A and C, 
not A and B, A and not C, and A and not B, all ORD together to produce the disagree output. So that's the circuit. But when I look at those two zeros in the truth table, I wonder if we've really produced the smallest possible digital logic circuit. I mean, all the, all the circuit has to do in order to distinguish between the input combinations where there are ones in the truth table and the input combinations where there are zeros in the truth table, maybe, maybe it would be simpler to detect the zeros than to detect the ones. We've used the magic of Karnar maps to cut down the number of terms, but as I said, it's only gone down from six terms to four because the ones aren't very nicely disposed in the truth table. True, the AND gates are two input AND gates rather than three input AND gates, but that's not such a big saving. So maybe, maybe we should look at producing a circuit that recognises the zeros instead of the ones. That would produce an output that was true when there was complete agreement between the sensors, and the inverse of that signal would be true if there was any disagreement, which of course is what we're looking for. Let's get rid of the rings around the ones so that we can concentrate on the zeros. There are two of those. Unfortunately, they, they can't be grouped because they aren't adjacent. So the Boolean expression that corresponds to those two zeros has two terms. But remember, that Boolean expression will detect the inverse of the condition that we want. So we invert it. And that's the Boolean expression for the signal that we're looking for. Disagreement. It only has two terms. Admittedly, they both involve three variables, so we'll need three input AND gates, but that's not a big price to play, pay. Oh, and there's that extra inversion, but, but we'll get to that in a minute. So now we can construct the circuit. Same inputs as before, but now only two AND gates. The first picks up the NOT A and NOT B and NOT C input combination. That's when all of the sensors are indicating that there's a problem. And the second AND gate picks up the A and B and C combination. Either of those indicates that the sensors are in agreement. So all we need now is to invert that output, which we can do by swapping the OR gate for an OR gate. Remember, that's a gate that produces the inverse of an OR function. And, as it happens, a NOR gate involves fewer transistors than an OR gate. So if you're into micro-optimization of your digital logic, it's a cheaper alternative. Maybe ooh, a millionth of a cent. And there's our desired circuit. And overall, our new so circuit involves fewer gates. So if you really want to minimize a combinatorial circuit, it's worth drawing up Karnar maps for both the zeros and the ones to see which of the two Karnar maps has fewer rings. Then implement that circuit, not forgetting that you need to use a NOR gate instead of an OR gate if you choose the zeros alternative. Now here's one final exercise in the design of combinatorial circuits. Let's say that we're involved in the planning of the electrical systems for a modern building that has a long corridor with four doors and a light switch beside each door. The door at the end of the corridor shares the light switch of the nearest side door. Now, clearly each light switch should be able to turn the lights on or off. There are ways of doing that by switching the AC mains current, but for whatever reason we've decided to use a digital logic circuit instead. So. What are the conditions that turn the lights on and off? First of all, if all of the switches are in the up position, the lights are off. When we flip one of the switches, the lights turn on. Flip another, and the lights turn off. Flip a third, and they turn on again. It soon becomes apparent that when an even number of switches is down, which of course includes zero, the lights are off. When an odd number are down, the lights are on. Let's say that the switches generate a one output when they're in the down position. So we need to design a circuit that can detect an odd number of ones. 
we've got four variables each light switch is effectively an input variable so we draw up our trusty four variable Carnot map and set about populating it now remember that we want to detect an odd number of ones that isn't the same as detecting that ABCD is an odd number in other words we're not interested in the numeric value of ABCD as a binary number just in how many of those four bits are ones so we insert a one in each cell on the table where that uh, condition is fulfilled and blow me down there are no adjacent ones the Carnot map is telling us that no minimization is possible and our trick of looking at the zeros won't help because they're arranged in a diagonal pattern just like the ones with no adjacent pairs so we'll just have to write out the boolean expression for each of the eight input combinations that produces a one output and here it is with all of its eight terms so we can get on with drawing up the circuit diagram as before if you haven't yet covered digital circuit design wait till you've dealt with that before trying to absorb the rest of this slide okay then this time we've got four inputs and eight four input and gates now this diagram is going to look quite messy if I draw in all four inputs for each of the AND gates that's 32 wires and then start putting the blobs of solder where the connections are there's a diagrammatic convention that's sometimes used for these more complex diagrams and that's to show only a single wire going into the AND gate with all of the connections made to that single wire now be quite clear about this the real AND gate actually has four input wires and each of its inputs is connected to only one of the data inputs A, B, C and D. This is only a shorthand diagrammatic convention to make it easier to read and in fact draw the circuit diagram. So we connect up the other seven AND gates using the same diagrammatic convention and add the blobs of solder so that the circuit corresponds to the Boolean expression that we have on the left hand side nothing remains but to connect up the OR gate and we have our desired output but I want to come back to the Carnot map for just a moment was it a failure of the Carnot map approach that it was unable to show us any minimizations I don't think so I think you could stare at that complicated boolean expression on the left for some time and try a whole lot of algebraic minimizations before you reach the conclusion that no minimization was possible for example the first and last terms on each line all have D in common is there therefore any benefit to be had from factoring out those D's and minimizing the remaining parts of the terms well no it turns out that there isn't and in fact none of the other possible minimizations that it might occur to you to try will produce a smaller expression but without the Carnot map it could take you some time to come to that conclusion with the Carnot map on the other hand you can literally see the big picture and reach the same conclusion much more quickly and just as importantly more confidently so even in this unusual situation the Carnot map approach is beneficial 